Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control. We are confirming acquisition of your signal. You are live in 5, 4, 3, 2... Hello and welcome to episode 4 of Gardeners of the Galaxy, a podcast for all of the sentient beings in the universe who have a passion for plants. I'm Emma the Space Gardener and I will be your host as we explore gardening on Earth and beyond. In this episode we're taking a peek at the early history of seeds in space, but while we're waiting for the time machine to warm up, let's have a look at some recent space gardening news stories. In February 2020, geography professor Eric Vaz published a scientific paper called Mars Terraforming, a Geographic Information Systems Framework. Geographic information systems are a tool that allows researchers to understand the spatial distribution of environmental characteristics, including vegetation. The goal of Vaz's study was to use environmental data from Earth and Mars to understand better which areas on Earth share the most similarities with Mars. He and master's student Alyssa Penfound developed a GIS framework that can be used to determine which earth plants are most likely to survive in a Martian environment. The paper talks about terraforming in a more limited sense than we usually see in science fiction. Rather than trying to turn Mars into a lush copy of Earth, it's aiming for a more manageable goal. The idea would be to create small, self-sustaining habitats on Mars, a bit like giant terrariums. The plants in those terrariums would need to be able to make use of Martian soil, thrive on the available sunlight and produce oxygen. They would need to be sourced from places on Earth with limited water and be able to withstand higher levels of ultraviolet radiation. Suitable plants would also take up minimal space, produce large quantities of seeds and be low maintenance to grow. As Vaz explains, the idea is that you need a resilient species that can independently, with little genetic modification, colonise the planet like an invasive species and cope with similar temperature extremes. The researchers analyse the vegetation in three areas on Earth that are similar to Mars, the Antarctic Peninsula, Ellesmere Island and Devon Island. They discovered that bluegrass, a plant that survives in Canada's Arctic regions, might be humanity's best hope to see life off-planet. It's able to withstand sub-zero temperatures and intense solar radiation, takes up minimal space, requires little maintenance and produces large quantities of seeds. The results also suggest that bryophytes, small plants like mosses, liverworts and hornworts, and tracheophytes such as ferns and horsetails, are worth further research. The study didn't investigate any edible plants, however, the methodology used could be used in the future to discover which edible plants grow in the most Mars-like areas on Earth. I'll put a link to the paper in the show notes for those of you who would like to read the whole thing. If you live in the UK, then you've probably noticed that an increasing number of farmers seem to be growing solar panels. I had assumed that that was the primary use for the fields, and that perhaps a few sheep would be allowed to graze there occasionally to keep the grass under control. However, it appears that a growing trend in farming is agrivoltaics, which involves growing food under solar panels. Getting two yields from the same space, food and energy, is the obvious motive. However, solar panels can also protect crops from extreme weather, and the shade they cast can reduce the need for irrigation. However, that shade can be a double-edged sword, limiting plant growth and reducing yields. In a study recently published in Advanced Energy Materials, researchers investigated the effect of using a new type of solar panel that is transparent and tinted. These panels absorb blue and green light to make electricity, but allow red light to reach the plants below. Compared with plants grown underneath clear panels, yields of spinach and basil under the tinted panels were lower, but not by that much. Intriguingly, the plants grown under the panels grew fewer roots but more stems and leaves. This suggests that tinted panels may work well combined with leafy crops, and the leaves growing under the tinted panels had much higher protein levels, which could help in the transition to more plant-based diets. How much extra income would be generated for the farmer depends on the crop grown, how much it sells for and the reduction in yield the panel causes. So adding electricity production to a spinach crop could give 35% more income, while for basil it's only about 2.5%. There's also the potential for glazing greenhouses with tinted solar panels in the future. As usual, I'll put a link to the study in the show notes for you. An article in the New Statesman last month has caused a bit of an international storm in a teacup. In The Politics of the Spice Rack, Russia's Love of Dill, writer Lisa Hasseldine makes a brief mention of cosmonauts requesting dill on their space flights thanks to its anti-flatulent properties. It's not the first time I have heard that mentioned. Alice Fowler's book A Modern Herbal says that supposedly Russian cosmonauts on space flights with confined quarters and a closed air supply asked for dill. Astronaut Scott Kelly backs this up in his book, Endurance, A Year in Space, A Lifetime of Discovery. 
in which he talks about the food he ate during his training in Russia. Kelly says he asked one of his cosmonaut colleagues, Jenedy Padalka, why everything comes covered in dill. Jenedy replied, It's from when the Russian diet consisted mostly of potatoes, cabbage and vodka. Dill gets rid of farts. However, in an article in Sputnik News, this claim has been firmly denied by Dr. Alexander Aguriev, a veteran expert in space food and head of the nutrition department at the Russian Academy of Sciences Institute of Biomedical Problems. He says that he can't remember a single request to send Dill to space from cosmonauts going back to 1968 when he began working in the field of space food, and that the herb is not included in the list of fresh foods delivered to cosmonauts. The list of fresh fruits and vegetables which are sent includes tomatoes, onions, garlic, oranges and grapefruits. Cucumbers don't go because they spoil easily, and tangerines aren't on the menu because they don't arrive in space in good condition. However, the Russians have tried growing dill in space. The Russian Salyut 6 space station was launched in September 1977 and remained aloft until July 1982. Cosmonaut Valery Ryumin was quite the space gardener, turning empty film cassettes, equipment casings and food containers into impromptu plant pots. He turned the space station into a jungle of onions, peas, radishes, lettuce, wheat, cucumbers, garlic, parsley and dill. He managed to grow plants on from seedlings sent from Earth, but the early experiments on Sally at 6 failed to grow plants from seed. Later on, Ryumin worked out that the space station atmosphere was to blame. Seeds were then able to germinate and grow in space greenhouses designed with separate atmospheres and ethylene filters. In the last episode, I talked about the Japanese space agency project that will be blasting seeds into space this October. This is the Asian Herbs in Space project, and for their contribution, Australia have chosen to send seeds of golden wattle. At the end of August, they held a ceremony in which the Australian ambassador formally handed over 50 grams of seed to the JAXA vice president of the Australian embassy in Tokyo. The seeds were collected from a wild population in Victoria. The golden wattle is the national flower of Australia and is known to have anti-cancer effects. Acacias, in general, can help to stabilise soils and prevent erosion, and they fix nitrogen in the soil and provide fodder for sheep. A SpaceX launch will take the seeds to JAXA's Kibo module on the International Space Station for a six-month stay. When they return to Earth, the inaugural Australian Seeds in Space educational programme will see students across Australia planting the space seeds and comparing their growth to that of control seeds that stayed on Earth. The idea is to inspire the next generation to consider careers in the space industry. If you're wealthy enough to consider being a space tourist, what exactly does your money buy you? At the 5th Global Satellite and Space Show, Dmitry Loskutov, the head of Glav Cosmos, presented the options on offer. Apparently the basic space tourist package, and if you have to ask how much it is, you can't afford to go, includes medical assistance, training in the Russian Space Centre, return flights to the International Space Station and the search and rescue services that return you to civilization from your out-of-the-way landing spot. Quick diversion, did you know that Soyuz capsules used to be equipped with a firearm in case your rescue is delayed and you find yourself having to fend off a bear? But that practice seems to have been discontinued around 2013. Okay, so on top of your basic space tourist package with the Russians, you can pay for some optional extras, which include zero-g training on a vomit comet, developing your own personal space food kit, being assisted with your scientific research project in orbit, and doing a spacewalk. And once you've returned to Earth, you can also purchase your Soyuz re-entry capsule, which will make a lovely memento of your trip into space. Park that in your driveway and be the envy of all your neighbours. From the moment humans started to reach for the skies, we have used other species from Earth to test what's safe and what happens to life away from its natural habitat on the planet's surface. On September 19th, 1783, Joseph and Etienne Montgolfier carried out a hot air balloon demonstration in front of French King Louis XVI and the royal family in the palace forecourt. The basket below the balloon held a sheep, duck and a cockerel, making it the first passenger flight in history, as well as the first aeronautical scientific experiment with animal subjects. After ascending to 600 metres, the fabric of the balloon ripped. It descended slowly, landing three and a half kilometres away. When it transpired that the cockerel had a damaged wing, the first air accident investigation began. It concluded that the sheep had kicked the poor bird, and it had not suffered due to the flight. We have to wait more than 150 years for the first recorded experiment sending seeds aloft. 
During the Second World War, Werner von Braun developed rocket technology for the Nazis. His work culminated in the V-2, the world's first long-range guided ballistic missile. From September 1944, the German forces launched 3,000 V-2s against London, Antwerp and Liège. As the war drew to a close, the Allies rushed to capture German technology and manufacturing sites. Werner von Braun surrendered to the Americans with more than 100 key V-2 personnel. The US also collected enough hardware to build around 80 V-2 missiles. The Soviets took over the V-2 manufacturing facilities and moved production to the Soviet Union. In 1946, the United States Naval Research Laboratory, NRL, was collaborating with scientists from Harvard University to send biological specimens into the upper atmosphere, launched on V-2 rockets from White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. The biologists wanted to study the effects of the radiation at high altitudes using various organisms. They were particularly interested in the possibility of genetic mutations. They supplied the NRL with some specially developed strains of seed, which became the first seeds in space on the 9th of July 1946. The rocket reached an altitude of 134 kilometres, but its payload was not recovered. I'm going to pause here for a moment to consider what in space means. Theodore von Kármán was the first person to calculate the altitude at which the atmosphere becomes too thin for routine flight. His answer was 83.6 kilometres, 51.9 miles. The boundary between Earth's atmosphere and outer space is therefore known as the Kármán line. If you reach an altitude above the Kármán line, then you're in space. However, there's no single definition of where that occurs. The Fédération Aéronautique Internationale defines space as beginning 100 kilometres up, which is about 62 miles. NASA and the US Air Force use 50 miles, 80 kilometres, above sea level. OK, so a second rocket flight launched on the 19th of July 1946 contained a second batch of the seeds, but only reached 6 kilometres in altitude. Again, the sample seeds were not recovered. As the NRL prepared for their next missile launch, the engineers realised they had run out of the special seeds from Harvard. As they were not anticipating being able to recover the seeds, they just nipped out to a hardware store in Las Cruces and bought a regular packet of maize seeds. In fact, the flight exceeded all expectations and those seeds became the first to travel into space and be recovered. The well-travelled seeds were sent to Harvard along with the rest of the packet, which served as the experiment control. Eventually, the NRL ran out of V-2 rockets and didn't build any more. Investigations into the effects of cosmic radiation on plant seeds and other organisms continued using balloons. Balloon experiments, which continue to this day, don't take payloads into space, but they do offer longer exposure times at high altitude than a rocket. In 1965, when Ed White became the first American to leave his spacecraft and perform an EVA, a spacewalk, he carried mustard seeds in his spacesuit pocket. This was a reference to the Bible's description of Jesus using mustard seeds as a model of the growth of the Kingdom of God, from an extremely tiny seed to the largest of all garden plants. For Ed White, the seeds were an example of the tiny amount of faith needed to accomplish so much. Though space-flown seeds have become collector's items and some have been sold at auction over the last few years. The UK's national fruit collection is grown at Brogdale in Kent, with more than 2,000 varieties of apple, 500 of pear, 350 of plum, 322 of cherry and smaller collections of bush fruits, nuts and grapes. It's one of the largest collections of fruit trees and plants in the world. It's a regular Noah's Ark for fruit, with two trees or bushes of each variety in case one is lost. It's possible to visit and I'll put a link to the website in the show notes for you. The National Fruit Collection has been maintained at Brogdale since 1952, and in 1969 it was involved in sending apple seeds from Newton's apple tree into space on the Apollo 10 mission. There's a confirmation letter signed by the three astronauts, Thomas Stafford, John Young and Eugene Cernan. Apollo 10 was the dress rehearsal for the moon landing, doing everything but land on the moon. The apple seeds were carried inside the lunar module, which was named Charlie Brown. They got as close as nine miles above the lunar surface. The letter states that European white birch seeds were also included in the mission. The letter is addressed to Philip M. Mikoda in Windsor, New York. He was associated with Peacock Hill, which seems to have been an exotic bird farm. It looks as though Mikoda arranged the launch of the seeds, which explains why the package also contained peacock feathers. Mikoda later wrote to Brogdale, stating that the seeds had begun to germinate once they returned to Earth. He wanted more seeds to send on Apollo 11. Apparently, Mikoda served as a photography advisor on NASA's manned space program. He seems to have worked for the GAF Corporation in Binghampton, New York. That company supplied NASA with high-speed, high-resolution films and was the first to receive undeveloped rolls of film directly from the space missions. It's surprisingly difficult to find any more details about the seeds and other items that came so close to the moon on Apollo 10. And in 1971, the Apollo 14 mission carried tree seeds into space. Astronaut Stuart Rusa had been a smoke jumper with the US Forest Service. 
I guess once you've parachuted into forest fire zones, going into space is a piece of cake. After the chief of the forest service, Ed Cliff, asked him to take tree seeds into space, Rusa packed hundreds of seeds from redwood, loblolly pine, sycamore, douglas fir and sweet gum trees into his personal travel kit, which orbited the moon 34 times. After their flight, and a bit of a container mishap, the seeds were given back to the Forest Service, who grew them. These seeds became the famous moon trees. Some moon trees are still thriving, although the records of their locations are patchy. Seeds are small and lightweight, and so are ideal candidates for space experiments. This may well not be the complete list of early space-going seeds, so I will keep researching. That's it for this episode. If you're enjoying Gardeners of the Galaxy, then please take a moment to like, retweet or share the link so that we can grow our Space Gardener community. And you can always leave a nice comment on my blog, which gives me a warm and fuzzy feeling. For those of you who are in a position to support the show financially, I have set up three levels of support on Patreon. £3 a month will help you pay for the things the show needs, which includes hosting and equipment costs. The higher levels of support will allow me to spend more time on the show. So for £5 a month, you'll get extended episodes, which will have extra content and longer interviews. And for £10 a month, you'll also get extra bonus episodes. If you're based in the US or in Europe, don't worry, Patreon will sort out the currency conversion for you. If you'd prefer to make a one-off donation, then I have a virtual tip jar on the sidebar of my website, which is theunconventionalgardener.com. That's where you'll find the show notes and lots more information on growing plants on Earth and beyond. You can also find me on Twitter at Orbital Gardens. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control, confirming termination of your signal. We have spoken to the engineering team about the smell you've reported, and they have requested that you try stirring the WC tank. Mission Control out. <laughs>